Grace, mercy, and peace be unto you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Our text for this morning is our Gospel lesson for Palm Sunday. The account of the triumphal entry from John chapter 12, especially his unique quotation from Zechariah 9 verse 9, Fear not, daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. This is the text. Dear brothers and sisters in the Lord Christ Jesus, I just love the Palm Sunday imagery. Doesn't the sanctuary just seem jubilant to you this morning? With the palms on the banners, the palm plants up here in the chancel, the palms waving in the congregation. My earliest memory of the sheer joy of being with the people of God in church was as a child attending my uncle's congregation with my family in Frankentrost, Michigan. It was a Palm Sunday, if I remember correctly. It could have been Easter, but there were palms. There were palms in the sanctuary, and I vividly remember those palms. And that, combined with the jubilant hymns, made me feel almost as if I were getting a taste of heaven. The Palm Sunday imagery is beautiful, it's glorious, and yet... You might say that the centerpiece of the scriptural Palm Sunday imagery is missing this morning. I see palms here, there, everywhere, but where is the donkey? After all, the donkey is of great significance for the evangelists. And not just for John. John, of course, mentions the donkey here. Says that Jesus had found a young donkey and sat on it. And he quotes from Zechariah, Your king is coming sitting on a donkey's colt. In other ways, John's gospel is rather different from Matthew, Mark, and Luke, from what we call the synoptics, because they all kind of look at these stories from a similar perspective. They all have the same point of view. They record the triumphal entry in a pretty uniform way. They have Jesus coming to the Mount of Olives. He sends two disciples ahead to find the donkey and the donkey's colt. They have a conversation with the donkey's owner and says, The Lord has need of it. They bring the donkey on which no one has ever yet sat. Jesus sits on it. They put their cloaks on the ground before him. And he enters the city and they take palm branches and wave them before him. And they say, Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. The synoptics follow pretty much the same pattern, but John's gospel is rather different. He leaves some things out, he adds some extra things, but one thing that he shares in common with the other gospels is mention of this donkey. So what's with the donkey? Why is this donkey so significant? Why do we have four different evangelists recording for us that Jesus rode into the city on a donkey? Well, of course, it's because it was the fulfillment of Scripture. Zechariah 9, verse 9 prophesied that the Christ, the son of David, would ride into the holy city on a donkey, on the foal of a beast of burden. But why then did Zechariah feel the need to point that out? Why was that such critical imagery for Jesus to adopt on his triumphal entry? Well, believe it or not, the donkey relates to a little tweak that John makes to his quotation from Zechariah. Fear not, daughter of Zion. Fear not, he says, and that's a quote. But if you were to look up Zechariah 9, verse 9, you wouldn't find it there. You wouldn't find fear not. You'd find rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout for joy, Jerusalem. No mention of fear. When I first noticed this, I thought, hmm, maybe John is quoting from the Septuagint, from the Greek translation of the Old Testament. But I looked up my Greek Septuagint, found Zechariah 9, verse 9, and no, Zechariah in the Septuagint matches the Hebrew text. Rejoice greatly, no mention of fear. 
The fact is, John is not quoting Zechariah 9, verse 9 directly when he says, fear not. And he could say, well, it's because he's speaking as he is moved by the Holy Ghost. And the Holy Ghost wrote Zechariah 9, verse 9. And who has the right to alter it but the Holy Ghost himself, the author of the text? But there's more to it than that. It seems that John is borrowing the fear not language from elsewhere in the prophets, perhaps from Zephaniah, who has some parallel passages to this passage from Zechariah 9, verse 9, and does say, fear not. John wants to connect fear not with the donkey. Fear not, daughter of Zion. Behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. So what does the donkey have to do with fear not? There are two critical points through which the donkey shows us we need not fear. One is that it shows us the manner in which Jesus as king is entering among his people. We don't need to be afraid of him. And second, it shows that he is our king. And because he is our king, we need not fear our enemies. The donkey helps to show that we need not fear our king himself, and because he's with us, we need not fear our enemies. So, how does the donkey show that we need not fear Jesus when he comes? Well, Jesus is the Son of God. He's one God with the Father Almighty. And as God, He is very much worthy of our fear. The Scriptures are unanimous that we ought to fear God. And we ought to fear Him not only in the sense that we respect Him or stand in awe before Him or behave in reverence toward Him. We ought to fear His wrath. We ought to fear His punishments. As we say in the Catechism, explaining all the commandments, we should fear His wrath and not act contrary to these commandments. God is to be feared, and what distinguishes the wicked is that they do not fear God. They don't care about His commandments because they don't fear that God is going to punish them for breaking those commandments. We ought to fear God, and since Jesus is the Son of God, we ought to fear Him as well. And there is a sense in which that continues. We ought to fear Jesus today. Recognize Him as the one who has authority to punish transgressors who will at the last be enthroned in glory. But consider, there will be a lot of fear of Jesus going on on the last day. When He comes in glory, attended by His holy angels, when He is enthroned for judgment, when all the nations are gathered before Him and we all must give an account... That will be the time to fear Jesus. His enemies will cower before Him, and they will receive the just and terrible sentence which He, our King, hands down from His throne. But how different was His coming to Jerusalem? If I were God, and I'm glad I'm not for many reasons, I would make a real mess of it, if I were God and I were planning my triumphal entry into Jerusalem, I think I would ride on a great steed of war, dignified with splendor and honor and majesty. And I'd have my disciples dressed in armor with swords and shields and spears and helmets, showing that they mean business. And since I'd be God... Why not also be accompanied by 10,000 myriads of angels, the angelic legions dressed for battle, shining with divine glory? What a spectacle that would be! How I would strike fear and terror into my enemies, into my own people. But I'm not God. Jesus is God. And Jesus chose a very different means of entry into the holy city. Jesus did not come on a steed of war. He didn't come surrounded by soldiers. He didn't come attended by legions of angels. Well, if they were there, they weren't seen by the people. No, Jesus came in a different manner. He came humble. He came meek. He came mounted on a donkey, on the foal of a beast of burden. Jesus came in mercy. He came in peace. 
He didn't come to judge and condemn His people. He didn't come to make war upon them. He didn't come to terrify them. He came to love them and die for them and save them from their sins. Jesus came to unite with His people, to be their gracious Lord, the one who would care for them and nourish them, the one who would give His life for them. Jesus signals that by riding into the city of Jerusalem, not on a war horse, but on a donkey. And that same signal that Jesus gave to His people at the triumphal entry, He gives to us today, because if we consider it, Jesus is present among us now. He's promised to be. He said, where two or three are gathered in My name, there am I among them. Jesus is most assuredly here now among us. And how is He here? By what means is He here? Do you see soldiers? Do you see weapons? Do you see a great horse of war? I don't either. What do we see? Well, not much. What we do hear, we hear the Word of God. We hear His Scriptures read. We hear His Word proclaimed. That Word is how Jesus enters among us. Not to make war upon us, but to reign graciously among us, to be meek and humble. And furthermore, in just a few minutes, we're going to be receiving very humble bread and wine. There's nothing remarkable right now about these substances that we have on the altar. It's just bread like any other bread. Well, maybe even less desirable to eat than most other bread. The wine is pretty good, but there's nothing really special about it. It's just wine. But in a few moments, that bread will become the means through which Jesus comes to be with His people. That wine bought from the grocery store will be the means that Jesus uses to saddle up and come among His people to give us His body to eat and His blood to drink to assure us that as He comes to us under these humble forms, He's coming meek. He's coming in peace. He's coming in such a way that we need not fear Him. You don't have to be afraid of your Jesus as He comes to you today. Jesus signals that by riding on the donkey. But He also signals something more. Not only is He Himself humble and meek, but riding on the donkey is a signal to His people that He's coming to them as their King. And therefore, as their King, He's going to protect and defend them from their enemies. And who are their enemies? Well, their enemies could be said to be the Romans. The Romans represented by Pontius Pilate, the governor of Judea, who's reigning right there with sort of a reign of terror in Jerusalem. But that's not the enemy that Jesus is going to overthrow for His people. There are much greater enemies. Of course, our greatest personal enemy is the devil and his minions, the prince of the power of the air. But the devil has two great weapons at his disposal that he uses against the people of God, against those whom he tyrannizes, sin and death. Sin and death cast us into despair, and they, more than anything else, give us cause to fear. But Jesus says, fear not, because I'm coming as your king. And as your king, I'm going to deliver you from your great enemies, sin and death. So how does the donkey show that Jesus is a king? What does a donkey have to do with kingship? When I think about a king... I don't immediately think about a donkey. I think maybe a crown and a scepter and a, a white beard, the kingly robes, a throne, things like that. But when an ancient Israelite thought about a king, one thing he would think of was the king riding into his city on a donkey. There's a very dramatic episode in the Old Testament when King David is on his deathbed. He's weak, he's old, he's getting ready to go to his fathers. And then one of his sons decides to usurp the kingdom. He's going to take everything over and pretend to be his father's legitimate heir. Well, Bathsheba, one of David's wives, knows that David intends her son Solomon to be his heir. And she knows that if this other son 
becomes king, Solomon's days are numbered and so are her own. So Bathsheba comes to David and says, please coronate Solomon now. Let all Israel know that he is your chosen heir. And so David arranges everything and he has Solomon, his son, ride into the holy city. How does he ride into the holy city? Solomon rides into Jerusalem on a donkey. Not just any donkey, his father's donkey to show that he is the true, legitimate son and heir of David. And as the son of David, riding in on his father's beast of burden, he's coming to reign as king among his people, king in grace and mercy and in peace, as the name Solomon signifies. So to ride into Jerusalem on a donkey is a signal to the people of God, your king is coming. And since Jesus is coming into Jerusalem as king, as recognized by the people here who address him as the son of David and sing Hosanna, if Jesus is riding into the city as king, that means he's here to defend and protect and provide for his people. And how is he going to do that? By delivering them from sin and death. Of course, Jesus comes into the holy city chiefly to die. That's his great kingly act. He dies as a sacrifice for the sin of His people, and not for theirs only, but for the sin of the whole world. He sheds His blood on the cross so that all of our sins have their complete and final punishment in the death of God's Son Himself. By suffering on the cross and dying in our stead and rising again for our justification, Jesus delivers us from our great enemy of sin. And because Jesus has delivered us from sin, our sin no longer has power to condemn us. If we repent of our sin and turn from it and cease from it and turn to Him in faith and seek from Him the forgiveness of our sins, we have it. We have deliverance. We have salvation. We have freedom from fear because our King has come to us. And not only has Jesus delivered us from the fear of sin, He has also delivered us from the fear of what the Scriptures call the last enemy to be defeated, and that is death. Are you afraid of death? I have to admit that I am. My dad has always told us boys that he is more scared of public speaking than he is of death. I cannot say that I agree. I'm scared of death. Even though I'm a Christian, even though I believe that when I die, I will go to paradise to be with my Savior. Nevertheless, there are a lot of unknowns, and I've still got my old sinful flesh that wants to cling to the pleasures of this life and doesn't want to see it all turn into this heavenly existence. I'm afraid of death, and I'm sure most of us are in one form or another. But Jesus says you don't have to be. You don't have to be afraid of death, because I have defeated that enemy too. By dealing with sin, Jesus has also dealt with death. If our sin cannot condemn us, well, sin is what leads to death. And because Jesus as our King has come to us, as shown by His riding into the city on a donkey, we no longer need fear death because it is a conquered enemy under His feet. And knowing that Jesus is here among you now as your King, that He has come to you in His Word, that you are soon to receive Him in the sacrament of His body and blood, you too have deliverance from these fears, from the fear of sin, from the fear of death, from the fear of whatever enemies of God's truth might present themselves. Jesus protects and delivers you from them all. He is your King. How much we see in this donkey. Deliverance from fear. Why? Because Jesus chose a donkey, not a steed of war, but a humble beast of burden for his entry among his people, to show them that he comes not to destroy them, but to be at peace. And no fear, because this donkey bears the king, the son of David, who is promised to defeat sin and death for the sake of his people. As the day progresses, if while you're going about your lives, you happen to see Palm Sunday imagery that includes a donkey, I'd like you to think about that fear connection. Remember that donkey is significant. God chose it for a reason. 
And the reason Jesus rode into the city on a donkey was to show that his people need not fear. Fear not, daughter of Zion. Behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. Amen. The peace of God which surpasses all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.